in the book of Proverbs, chapter 4 and verse 7, Solomon says, wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. But in all of thou getting, get an understanding. And certainly we are here tonight that we might get a spiritual understanding. And the only way you're going to get a spiritual understanding, you're going to have to go to the holy book of God. What Jesus declared in the Hebrew letter, chapter 10 and verse 7, he said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. Neighbor, when God speaks to us today, he speaks through the medium of this book. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, said in John 5 and 39, to search the scriptures. That is the Old Testament scriptures. Didn't have the new. But notice what else Jesus says. For in them, that is in the very possession of them, the oracles had been committed to the Jews. According to the Apostle Paul in Romans 3, 1 and 2. And they thought because they had the Old Testament scriptures, they thought that salvation had been achieved. But neighbor, not so. That's only perfected in the Christ. But since you got the Old Testament scriptures, if you just open up what you do have, neighbor, you'll see they're talking about me. I'm reminded of the second letter that Paul wrote to young Timothy. After Jesus Christ in his public ministry said, search the scriptures. Oh, we can make that examination tonight. Because all we have to do is look here and see what they say. And then examine ourselves. Second Corinthians 13, 9. To see had we complied with what the scriptures say. And in that way, only you'll know where you stand with the Lord. No wonder Paul told young Timothy to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, straightly cutting, handling the right, the word of truth. I want you to know tonight that the Bible is a book that must be rightly divided. You know, in this religious world, I am so convinced that people today are not confused over what the Bible teaches because they keep this closed. The people in the world today, they are confused over what the Bible does not teach. Not over what the Bible teaches. And it's a very dangerous thing to add to the word of the Lord. Now, if we're going to speak as dividing the word of truth, how can I do that tonight? Well, I can tell you how. If any man speak, let him speak as the utterance or oracles of God. And that phrase, oracles of God, just simply means by the authority of Christ in harmony with the Bible. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God give it. And if, if all of these religious persuasions, if all of us, We'll just go back to the Bible and speak as the oracles of God, then we'll all be speaking the same thing. Well, the Apostle Paul declared in the Corinthian letter, chapter 1 and verse 10, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. The religious world is not confused over what the Bible teaches because they never search the scriptures. They're always confused over what the Bible does not teach. And there's a very dangerous thing to add to the word of the Lord. The Bible tells us the dangers of adding to, and it tells us the dangers of taking away from. In the beginning part of the Bible, in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, the Bible says, Ye shall not add to the word of the Lord, as I have commanded you, neither shall you diminish all from it, but that you should keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I have commanded you. And right at the end of the Bible, Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. Listen to what Brother John penned it. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophets of this book. 
if any man shall add to these things, here when I add all the plagues that are written therein, if any man shall take away from the book of life, I'll take his name out of the holy city. And also in the middle of the Bible, Proverbs 30, verse 6, add thou not unto his words, lest he will reprove thee. Thou be found alive. Revelation 21 and 8 says some, a few, all of them shall have their part in the lake, which burn with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now what if some did not believe? May their unbelief make the faith of God of none effect. Yeah, let God be true and every man. So that's what we're trying to do. We're letting God be true. Every man a liar. When we think about the overriding theme, the Lord's church versus denominationalism, I like to call your attention first of all to that word denominate. It simply means to name. Then it carries the idea of division and division is carnality according to first corinthians chapter 3 verses 1 and 3 so here when we talk about that we see that was this great departure we start off talking about this word depart when we look at first timothy 4 Verses 1 beginning. Now the Spirit speaketh unmistakably. It speaketh succinctly. It speaketh expressly. That in a latter time some, not all neighbor, there has never been a total departure. And it never will be. Some is going to depart or no longer stand with God's original position. What was that position? The faith. Let me give you an illustration on that. When we talk about denominationalism, let's start off just looking at mathematics. We can do it from fractions because that top number, we always talk about something like a numerator. Or uh, the bottom number, we talk of something about like a uh, denominator. If you want to look at division, let's see something about division here. So when we talk about division, let's see, can I get something here? Usually when we talk about this number right there, we talk about that's a dividend. Then when we talk about this number up here, we usually talk about a quotient or quotient. Then, of course, the number right here is called a divisor. Now, as the last preacher said, there's over 45,000. My number's a little bit higher than that, according to religious base circles. There's over 45,000 different denominations, doctrines, teaching. Yet, the Bible says there is only one church. Now, I want anybody... You can go down to your nearest university. The man got the plaid on and the long gray beard. I want to know what divisor can you use to divide one and come up with 45,000. It's just that elementary, neighbor. It's just that elementary. You see, one is the only number that cannot be divided and come up with a whole. And it's so beautiful that God Almighty is the only one that did that. Because I read in Genesis chapter 2, when he took one person, took a real about that person, and made two. And then just in case evolution, or just in case these smart people want to argue that, then he took those same two people and made them back one in the marriage. Oh, yes, he did. One is the only number that you cannot divide and come up with the whole. And any time you get over one church, everything else is crooked. Two is crooked. Three is crooked. Four is crooked. Five is crooked. Six is crooked. Seven is crooked. Eight is crooked. Nine is crooked. Anything over one church neighbor is crooked. That's just simple mathematics. Now, when we think about that, when we think about division, when we think about that, there has been a departure. 
there has been a departure from the faith. Now, when we think about that, say, for instance, Acts chapter 20, verse number 28, beginning. Now, let's see something here. Because when we talk about it, my assigned uh, subject tonight is the Episcopalian Methodist. And just as the preacher said, all of them are basically the same thing. Now, if I just pick right back up from the last preacher, Waycaster, let's get out that Anglican thing there. Because after that, here comes the Episcopate of the Church of England. Now, when we think about the Church of England, and we think about the tentacles and how they began. You got at least seven men that are the founding fathers. Well, we start off with a man by the name of Thomas Kramer. You remember in 1749, 1549, this was the man that got the 35 oracles together and placed them in a book that's called the Book of Common Prayer. That's called the Book of Common Prayer. Then uh, Henry VIII is behind him. Then you have a man by the name of Matthew Parker. After Matthew Parker, there come Richard Hooker. Then after Richard Hooker, you got a series of men that's coming behind him. John Jewell and all of these men were the founding fathers of the church of England. Holy, wait a minute. Now, when politics gets involved, because Henry VIII, he wanted Thomas Kramer to actually give him an annulment because he was married to the first king of the first queen of England. That was a woman by the name of Catherine of Aragon. But then he saw this younger, this younger, beautiful woman. And that younger, beautiful woman was a man, by the name by the uh, woman by the name of Anne Boleyn, and he wasn't satisfied with that. After he got that certificate of a no man, then what does he do? He see another woman that he want to be involved with, and that woman's name was Jane Seymour. Oh, he wasn't satisfied with that. So he got himself involved with a woman by the name of Anne of Cleves. He wasn't satisfied with that. Then he got himself involved with a woman named Catherine. That's Catherine with a K. Catherine Howard wasn't satisfied with that. Then he got himself involved with another woman by the name of Catherine with a C. Catherine Paul. That's six, six marriages and annulments. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, denominationalism is so destructive. It destroys homes. It tears up governments. It's a damnable practice. Nothing good comes of it. And yet, because God says, God's law of marriage, Oh, yes, it is. That's one woman, one man from the marriage altar to the cemetery until death separates it. Not until sin separates it, until death separates it. That's God's law of marriage. Genesis chapter 2 and Matthew 19, 4 through 6. Not Matthew 19, 9. Matthew 19, 9 is the only exception to that rule. That is not the rule. Marriage is permanent. What therefore God has joined together. Let not man put asunder. That's God's law of marriage. He only gave that one exception. And we read about it in verse number nine. And as a result of that, now we see that ungodly practice. We see that ungodly practice. And as a result of that, now we see that the Church of England comes to the United States. Now they're called the Episcopalians. 
Look at the influence that the Episcopalians has had in the United States. As a matter of fact, there are more presidents of the United States were Episcopalians than any other religion. The first president, the fourth president, the fifth president, the ninth president, the tenth president, the twelfth president, the fourteenth president, the twenty-first president, the twenty, the thirty-second president, the thirty-eighth president, and the forty-first president. All Episcopalians. Started off with George Washington. And then the fourth one. James Madison, fifth one, James Monroe, ninth, William Henry Harrison, the tenth president was an Episcopalian, John Tyler, the twelfth president, Zachary Taylor, fourteenth president, John Pierce, twenty-first president, C.A. Arthur. For the second president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The 38th president, Gerald R. Ford. The 41st president, that sounds like Bush 41. How come him and his son, Bush 43, couldn't get together? Why is Bush 43 is a practicing Methodist? Don't tell me, don't tell Holmes. Denominationalism, tell Holmes. Bush 41, George Herbert Walker. Bush was an Episcopalian, but his son is a, seems like to me he's in this state too, isn't he? He's a practicing Methodist. Something is wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with this picture. Now, let's quickly examine, because this is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to just might as well get a double dose of it, because I was sitting there and I told my wife, I said, Brother Raycastle, I'm going to preach my whole sermon. I mean, word for word. That's speaking the same thing. And I want to make some comparisons here. And I'm going to show you that those 35 oracles, which is the Book of Common Prayer, when the Methodists got a hold to it, started by Wesley, in 1729, he took the same 35 oracles and subtract 15 of them. Come up with 24. Then he was so smart, he added one and said, now you cannot change these oracles. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. And I hold hands with Brother Mac, I hold hands with Jason and all the good pictures here. It tears my heart out. Because of what the influence of denominationalism is. And people are so hoodwinked today. They would rather hear a pleasing lie than unpleasing truth. It's a hurting thing, friend. But I want all of us to know something tonight. We got three things in front of us. We got the Episcopalians here. We got the Methodists here, and I'll show you they even contradict themselves. And we got the New Testament church. Now, somebody has to be wrong. But I want to tell you something. If you never remember anything I said tonight, you remember this. God cannot be involved in a self-contradiction. You can mark that down. The God in this book name is perfect. He's an errant. He doesn't make himself, he doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't oppose himself. He cannot lie. Numbers 23:19. Not a man that he should lie. He cannot lie. First Samuel 15:29. The prince of Israel cannot lie. Cannot lie. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 18. By two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. He cannot lie. Titus 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie. Now, can we all agree tonight, if there are inconsistencies, if there are contradictions, somebody is wrong, but we can agree, God is not wrong. God is not wrong. 
Now, the first doctrine I want to look at, I want you to turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 20, real quick, quick. Because here, with those articles, Henry VIII says that this governs the Episcopalian or the Church of England. Wesley and all of them come out, their heritage come out of the Catholic persuasion. And then from the Catholic persuasion, as we've already heard, uh, those 95 oppositions of thesis, nailed against the door of Wittenberg, and all these things I see wrong with the Catholic persuasion. Instead of them going back to the Bible, they start something else. And from there, and I know that there was some some information going on and some activity of the Anabaptists. I know about Muslims in 621, but that's not my argument tonight. Now, after that, we see these men become uh, Anglicans, as it's already been admirably dealt with, with John Knox and John Calvin. We pick up the baton from there, and we see King Henry VIII, and we see his influence over there. Now, his argument was there's one bishop that govern a multiplicity of dioceses. Well, that is not the argument that the Methodists use. The argument that the Methodists use that the general conference, I have all the references there. The general conference is the one that chooses the elders and the deacons. Let's see what God has to say about that. In Acts 20 and verse 17, here the apostle Paul called for someone to meet him out on the island of Miletus. And in verse 17, he's going to ordain elders. Verses 14 to 17. In every city. Now when I look at that word elders, because I got to show you, Paul would take Three Greek terms. Well, we're going to get six English words. And they, but they all refer to the same man. There is no difference with reference to authority with these terms. It is denominationalism, neighbor, that has made that distinction. And not God Almighty. When I look at that word elders, I got the word presbyteros. When I look at this word presbyteros, Now, when this word is transliterated, when this word is transliterated, the transliteration of words, you take that word out of its original vernacular. You bring that word over into another vernacular. Proposition well defined as half hour, young people. You bring it into another vernacular. You give that word a different pronunciation. You give that word a different spelling. But you can't tamper with the definition of the word. Please remember that. You can't tamper with the word. That's what denominationalism are doing, neighbor. They putting definitions on Bible words that God never put on there. Even some of my brethren. Now when this word is transliterated, we come up with the word presbyter. This is where you get your English word, elder, from. Now, let's look at verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and unto all of the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops to pastor the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Let's back up there. That made you bishops. You see that word there? Now I'm going to get where? The Episcopalians got that word from that Greek word that is episkopos. Now, this is where we get the Latin word bishop from. Well, we get our English word overseer. I know this correct neighbor because epi, epi means over. Episcopos come off of the Greek verb skepeo, which means to look, to watch. Sometimes it means see. So overseer is an adequate, ac- 
accurate translation of that word. Now notice something that's made you bishops to pastor or to tend or to feed. You see that word feed there? That is the Greek term uh, poimeno. That's where we get the Greek noun poimain. This is where we get the Latin word pastor from. Where we get our English word shepherd. And that lets me know something. There is no distinction with reference to authority with these terms. It is man that has made that distinction. This is the same man, but they are looked at from different viewpoints. That's all it is, friend. That's all it is. And no doubt, we've all seen signs. I am the bishop, pastor, overseer. Hold on, wait a minute. Would you follow a man that don't know what he is? All these terms refer to the same man. Now, let me get something else before I leave here. I want you to turn your Bibles quickly to 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Here, Peter does the same thing. But there's something here I want to show you real quickly before I leave. In 1 Peter 5, in verse number 1. Notice what it says. First Peter 5, verse number 1. What does it say? The elders which are among you, that same word, elders, I exalt who am a sum. That's the Greek term now. Sum. Sometimes you might have a co, or sometimes you might have fellow. Peter says, I am a fellow. Elder. Now notice something that Peter says there. You got that, Jason? Notice what he says there. And a, keep reading. The elders which are among you are exhort him also an elder and witness of the sufferings and a partaker of the glory that should be revealed. There we are. Yeah, keep reading. Feed the flock of Notice, there it is. That's our turn. Feed. I've already gone through that, but there's something in there I want to show you tonight. Feed the flock of God. Rich, read it. Which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. Keep reading. Not by constraint, but willingly. Mm -hmm. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Hold it. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Heritage. Neighbor, you see that word there. That is the Greek term. W.E. Vines has it. Kleros. K-L-E-R-O-S. Spirals of Hyates, Claro, it's the same word, K-L-E-R-O-O. That is the Greek term there. Now, the root word for that word, Claros, this is where we get our, and you all to be able to hear that word, this is where we get our English word clergy from. I know what I'm talking about, neighbor. This is where we get our English word clergy from. Neighbor, let me tell you something. I am the laity and you are the clergy. That's something Catholicism has started and it has drifted all the way down into other denominations. I'm telling you something, friend. In the New Testament church, I don't see that nowhere. Where I am the clergy and you are the laity. That's false. That's false. Let me give you another term now. Let me give you another term now. Back up to chapter 2 and verse number 9. Chapter 2 and verse number 9. Notice something. But you are what? But ye are a chosen generation, uh -huh. a royal priesthood, uh -huh. and holy nation, Read. a peculiar people. Holy. A peculiar what? People. You see that word people there? I have in that word the Greek term laos. I have in that Greek term the Greek term laos. Neighbor, this is where we get our English word laity from. Now, who is God's laity? The same people that's God's clergy. You can mark that down. You can mark that down. Christians 
are God's clergy and Christians are God's people or God's laity. That's something that Catholicism has started, neighbor. And I'm telling you, that doctrine is false. The next thing I want to look at, which is a doctrine that really, really has brought tears to my eyes. And that is the doctrine that the Episcopalian religion and many of the Methodists, they have this idea that Jesus Christ was crucified so that God can be reconciled back to man. That's a heartbreaking doctrine to me, neighbor. How can anyone be that confused? Are you suggesting to me that God committed some kind of sin? That's their doctrine. That's their teaching. And you had the quickened. Who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in the time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power there, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversations in time past. In the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, what would he loved us? Even when we are dead in sins, that's quickened us together with Christ. By grace, you are saved and has raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in ages to come, he may show forth the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us foot by Christ Jesus. That's D.I. with the genitive. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created. Watch the preposition. In Christ Jesus, in location. Not out of neighbor. The wrong preposition will make the wrong proposition every time. It brings tears to my eyes, neighbor. How can people butcher the word of God like they do? As if God owes something. God doesn't know either one of us a breath. We cannot put God in our debt. After you've done all of it, it's more of your duty to do what you're supposed to have done. We still can say unsought profitable servants. He didn't say, see, if he said out of, oh, we might be able to earn it. We might be able to deserve it. It might be a by right. That's what denominationalism teaches, neighbor, this grace-only doctrine. But that's not what the Bible teaches, neighbor. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Men in great expense, particularly Texas, Oklahoma. You never work oil out of the ground unless somewhere along the way it's been worked into the ground. Holy, wait a minute. I know good and well Shell put that oil down there. Holy, I'm sorry. Didn't British Petroleum put that oil down there? I, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't Exxon put that oil down there? Neighbor, that oil is down there by grace. That oil is down there by grace, neighbor. But British Petroleum got to go down there and pump it out. Shell got to go down there and pump it out, neighbor. And when Shell pump that all out and go through that process and I can go to a service station and pump gas in my car, I can say I got gas by grace after I pay for it. <laughs> that grace only doctrine, neighbor. It's a stench in the nostrils of God for the grace salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that they not, there are some things, the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24, there are some things that grace teaches me I must do. There are some things that grace teaches me I must not do. Grace say, I must deny ungodliness. That's what grace teaches me. Grace say, I must de deny worldly lust. Grace teaches me that I must live soberly. Grace teaches me that I must live righteously. Grace teaches me that I must live godly in this present world. 
No wonder the Apostle Paul said, shall we go on sinning? That's Megionato. Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? In other words, since I know God is, for, is a forgiving God, the more sin I do, the more grace I do. May it not be so. I'm reading it to you in the language, neighbor. Yo, King James Version has God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Grace teaches man that he must obey law. Now let's continue on. For by grace have you been saved through faith. Then not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast. For we as his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before day where we should walk in them. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which decircumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time, Paul says, ye were without Christ. Hold on, wait a minute. What Paul should have said, God was without Christ. And then you got to take the whole book of John out. In the beginning was the Hologos. And the Hologos was the word, and the word was with God. So you have to take that out the Bible. If you're going to adopt this kind of teachings, we were without Christ, being aliens from the coming with the visitor and stranger from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. What a tragic condition. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes will fall off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to making himself a twain, one new man, so making peace, and that he might Both. That's both Jew and non-Jew. Now let me ask you something. Where is the place, the spear of reconciliation? Think about it. Where does God do it? Where does he mend the fence? Where does he bridge the gap? Where is the place of reconciliation? All you got to do is just read the text. And that he might reconcile both under God in one body by the cross and having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace unto them that will fall off and to them which are nigh. Ephesians 2 1 to 17. Well, I asked that question, I have to ask, what is that body? Is it the same body? Is a church over here, church over there, here church, there church, everywhere church, church? No, friend. It's this word of God, neighbor. Brother Wake has already told us the seed of the kingdom is the word of God. You can mark that down. Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12. Every seed must produce after its own kind. If you want cone, maybe you got to plant cone. That's just all it is to it. And what if you are out in your garden planting corn and then all of a sudden a red-headed woodpecker come down and grab some of that seed and then he take that seed, flies to New York, drop it in another man's garden. What you think going to come up, a red-headed woodpecker? <laughs> What's coming up, New York? What's coming up? Every seed neighbor must produce after its kind. And there is just no way. If the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, there is no way you can get 45,000 different teachings. What if I stood up here tonight and just take the, the six or seven religious persuasions that we are examining this week? And let's just take baptism. I get up here tonight and I say, well, I preach the Baptist doctrine. You're saved at the point of faith. And baptism, baptism is an outward sign of an inward grace. And then the next night I get up, preach the Methodist doctrine. Oh, you can have some water sprinkled on you. 
The next night I get up, preach the Catholic doctrine, pour some water on you. Next night I get up, preach the Pentecostal persuasion. I want to be baptized in fire. And the next night, on and on and on, how much respect would you have for me as a gospel preacher? None at all. And if I can't get up here and teach baptism five ways and be right, then how can the Baptist, the Methodist, the Catholic, and all of the rest of them teach baptism all these ways and be right, neighbor? It's just that elementary. This is something that's not difficult for us to know. It is just that elementary. Let's go on to some other considerations, and then our time is getting away from here. Now, in those 35 articles, and trust me, I've examined them all, and they not only have error on every page, they have errors. (laughs) It's a sad situation, friend. We live by the authority of the Christ of glory. That's what we live by. And when the word of God says that there's one church, let me just ask you something, because in the back of the book, I have a a series of questions. I'll give you just a few more of those that are in preaching, just for you, something you think about. Ask this question sometimes. Do I have to be a member of your church in order to go to heaven? You know what the answer is going to be? No, you don't have to be a member of my church in order to go to heaven. You know, the next question I'm going to ask, then why on earth does your church exist? If I don't have to be a member of it, it has no reason to exist. But you got to be a member of the New Testament church if you want to go to heaven, neighbor. That's just all it is to it. You have to be a member of the New Testament church. And so when we look at that, And when we look at all of those comparisons, now the next thing I want to look at. Children are born in sin. And I worked through five different disciplines, three disciplines, two common prayer books. Children are born in sin. Wow. Isn't that something? It is to me. Because I thought that's by eight, nine different definitions for sin. I know we go to 1 John 3 and verse 4. Sin is a transgression of God's law, and rightfully so. 1 John 5 says all unrighteousness is sin. What is unrighteousness? Psalm 119, 172 says keeping all my commandments are righteous. So when we don't do what the Lord tells us to do, that's unrighteousness and that's sin, neighbor. It most certainly is. Now, if sin is a going onward, sin is a violation of God's law, then what has a child done? Let me illustrate it like this. You take a mother that's in prison. She conceived by a God in prison. She has that baby in prison. Question. Is that baby a prisoner? I'm going to tell you something, friend. Simple, illustrative arguments cannot be gainsaid. You can't get around them. Not at all. Then third and fourthly, when I think about this damnable doctrine, Not only the grace only, not only the faith only, but why on earth would Episcopalians tell me that the mode of their baptism is immersion in water? But you have your choice, the Methodist says. You can be sprinkled, pour water on you. If you want to be immersed in water, you can. Listen to me, friend. Water is the element. You can sprinkle the element, but you can't sprinkle the candidate. If you're going to sprinkle the candidate, you know what? You got to distribute that person in small drops of water. Well, let's try something else. Pouring. Is that baptism? You can pour water, but you can't pour a candidate. Because you have to turn them out 
in a stream. Baptism is an immersion. God chose water, yes. That's the element. If God had a chose buttermilk, maybe that's just all we have to do. We have to, you have to use buttermilk. If God had a chose gasoline, all I'm going to do is tell my smoking brethren to get back because we're getting ready to baptize in gasoline. Brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, we never went to a cemetery with a toe sticking up. Those people are buried out there. And why is it that we have to baptize babies if they have not obeyed or they have not violated God's law? There are some other things that I want to look at you with you. Let me give you just some concluding things along this line. I know the doctrine is false. People need to give it up. There's only one church that a person can be saved in. Not only all through that Ephesian letter, but even here in Ephesians 3. I therefore the prison of the Lord that you are worthy, Ephesians 4, that you are worthy of the vocation where which you are called. We've covered all this. That seven platform of unity. That you are worthy of the vocation where with your call, with all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, for bearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body. That's unity of organizational structure to me. One spirit. That's unity of revelation. One hope. Unity and purpose. One faith, unity in speech. One baptism, that's unity in practice. One God, unity in worship. Oh, I thought it was seven. Neighbor, right in the middle, there is one Lord. Because without King Jesus Christ, the whole thing falls. And brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, when Jesus Christ shed his blood on yonder's cross, we see there is one church, and it's for the same people. I, therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you. That's what he says. It's for all people, all races, all climate, all tongues, every race, class, tribe, and tongue have to be in that one church, the same church, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. We're dealing tonight with a reveal process. Everything God wants us to know has been revealed in this book. Everything. That's what we're dealing with, a reveal process. And I always ask this question. When we look at Ephesians 1 and verse, when you look at Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 6, Paul said, therefore, I'm a prisoner for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me, you would. How that by revelation. How do you get yours, Paul? Got it by revelation. Nobody's going to get that today. How that by revelation. He made known to me the mystery. As I wrote, when Paul got his by revelation, he wrote it down. You know what shepherd got to do, neighbor? Got to put his face in this book. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the midst of Christ, which is on the age was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed. Neighbor, we dealing with the reveal process here. Now, let me ask you this. Who told you that the Lord accept the Methodist church? Of the Episcopalians. You see, you cannot have a view about God unless that view has been revealed in the Word of God. How did we acquire that knowledge of denominationalism?
Paul said it best when he's talking about inspiration in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither in the hearts of men the things that God had stored up for them, which things also we speak after they were revealed to them by his spirit. We cannot know the mind of God unless God had revealed that to us in his word. We're dealing with the reveal process. And this is the whole entire book. Paul said it again. Paul said it like this. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. For therein, neighbor, that is in that gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed. We're dealing with the reveal process. You remember when Jesus came to Rock City, he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I am? Various answers were given. Then Jesus says, but whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you know what Jesus says? Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood, didn't get that from mom and daddy, for flesh and blood have not revealed. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, Petros Petro. Thou art Peter. Peter, you are a small rock. Thou art Peter. Peter, you are a tiny rock. Thou art Peter. All the preachers in here from Arkansas, they know Peter was a little rock. Thou art Peter. And upon this rock, not Peter, and upon this rock, this message laid, I'm going to be in my church. We are dealing with a revealed process. The church of our Lord was in existence before the Episcopalians came along 1,695 years. 1,695 years. Oh, I'm 70 years old. I'm 80 years old. Where has the church been all my life? A long time ago, your great 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 grandmama and your great 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 granddaddy may not have knew a thing about breakfast bacon, country ham, southern bell sausage, pork chops, or spare ribs, but neighbor, it was in the hog all the time. It was in the hog all the time. All you needed was a meat butcher to go up in that hog, cut that bacon out of there, and put it on your dinner table. That's all you needed. That's all you needed, neighbor. Where has the church been? All you need is just to stop by here. Isn't that right? That's all you need. Just stop by here on Sunday. Uh, any one of what these gospel preachers preach. And I'm telling you something, neighbor. Every time I get up and preach, I preach it like it's my last time. Because you know what? One of these old days is going to be my last time. One of these old days. You come where I preach on Sunday? That's exactly. Because if you want to see the devil run, neighbor, you got to shoot him in the face with this gospel gun. If you don't, he's going to get us. He most certainly is. Thank God before I take my seat, and I want to say with distinction, I hold hands again with Brother Mack and, and Brother Rollo, Hall back there, Denny, my best, best friend. He most certainly is. My family and his family have did so much together, so many, 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 many years, and so many different states. We certainly have. God has blessed us with that kind of relationship. And I appreciate each and every one of you. If you're in this assembly and you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, you might have been practicing all of these things for all of these years. Why are you in it? Because my mama said. Why are you in it? Because her grandmama. It sounds like that Samaritan woman. Why are you in there? Neighbor, it's a dangerous thing to keep your religion in mama's and daddy's name. It's a dangerous thing to do that, friend. Suppose your father was selling tomatoes.
and he was selling tomatoes only to discover years later instead of his scales reading a pound they was reading a half a pound now your father is an honest man had he known those scales was off he would have corrected that situation you see you tonight may have some information that your mom and daddy never had now can you be just that honest because the real test of a man's sincerity is when he find out he's wrong are you going to keep on using those faulty scales are you just going to keep on cheating people out their money are you going to keep on using those faulty scales you cannot remain honest and be in violation of God's law don't wait tonight because a little too late might be much too late. And one of the devil's greatest wiles is wait a while. The devil say, no, I see that. Oh, no, that might be right. But wait till tomorrow. Till tomorrow. Till tomorrow. Just keep on waiting till tomorrow. And then one of these days, oftentimes mean none of these days, neighbor, one of the greatest wiles of the devil, he say, wait a while. Don't do it now. Just keep on waiting till tomorrow. Ezekiel 19.5, the Bible says he is related. Waited. All hope was lost. Genesis 27, two hours it said, I know not the day of my death. First Samuel 20, verse 3, David says, but there's but a step between me and death. Second Samuel 14, 14, we must all knees die. And all is water spilt on the ground that cannot be gathered up again. Psalms 89, 47 say, remember how shall my time is. Psalm 9 and verse 9, our life is spent as a tale less told. Psalm 9 and verse 12, so teach us to number our days, not our tomorrow, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Man that is born of a woman is a few days, Job 14, 1. Job 9, 25, my days flee away. Job 7 and verse 6, my days are swifter than a weaver shuttle. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day bring forth. Proverbs 27, 1. Neighbor, before we stand and sing, let me give you one last illustration. This is what I want all of us to do. I want you to take out a piece of paper real quickly. Let's just see how long we got to live up in there. And when you take out that piece of paper, since the average age of a man is 73, average age of a woman is 79. Now, whatever your age is, what I want you to do, I want you to subtract if you're a woman, subtract your age from 79. If you're a man, subtract your age from 73. Now, if you're already in the negative, you better try to come on up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you better try to come on up here. <laughs> Don't throw your songbook at me. <laughs> because, because now... Since our days are numbered, just read you the passage. So what I want you to do, whatever time you got left, I want you to multiply that, those years, by 365. And that's going to give you how many days you got left to live. And then you take out some eight and a half by 11 paper, and you cut it in the squares. And however many days that you got. Some of us going to have some tall, like that little infant child there. Some of us, he going to have a tall stack. And then some of us going to have a medium stack. And some of us is not going to have a stack at all. That's what God says, three score and ten. If by reason of strength there be four score, we had better get busy. I'm telling your neighbor. You know that at the thing that is most emphasized on the obituary, you got euphemism. Sometimes you might have sunrise, sunset, or birth, death. But between that sunrise, sunset, you got a long dash. It's all about that dash, neighbor. It's all about that dash. But you know what I want to do to you? I want to relocate the dash for you tonight. You see, it is not when you are physically born, dash. It's when you're spiritually born, dash. You better try to have something to put in that dash. You can't put Jerry Jones and the Dallas Cowboys in that dash. Don't go up before God with an empty dash.
It's all about that dash. Having heard God's word, there's only one church. I don't need to delineate that for you. Why won't you believe it with all your heart? Set right there. Make up in your mind you're going to turn from everything that is contrary to the will of God. We usually refer to that as repentance. Repentance is to cease the practice of any sinful situation. That's what repentance is. It doesn't mean slow down. It doesn't mean change sins. It does not mean that. I didn't want to deal with that. Brother Wade Kessler mentioned that. But you know, there's 27 bodies now. And the 27 body in the Methodist church, we do know what that is, don't you? That's the global church. It's just what's on the news. And that global Methodist church is splitting from the United. You know why, don't you? Because they are now, that group want to accept same-sex marriages, homosexuality, and want to make them priests and deacons, elders. You see, this church split, start another branch of the same organization. Then the split split, start another branch of the same organization. Then the split split split, and start another branch of the same organization. Then the split 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 split, and start another branch of the same organization. And you just go on down the line, and this is all this confusion. But I'm telling you, God cannot be involved in a self-contradiction. If you need to be immersed in water, if you need to study a little bit more, Brother Jason Rollo is going to be standing here, one of the pastors here, and he's willing to address any spiritual situation, spiritual situation. Whatever your knees are, I want to let me know while we sing.